Are you ready to hear the word? We're so blessed to have Kent and Michelle Moonhank with us today, missionaries to Papua New Guinea, and Kent is a powerful teacher of the word, and uh, we've got some tough things coming ahead here in the book of Genesis, and I've asked him for some help, and so, <laughs> Kent, we turn it to you, brother. Help Thank us. you very much, Pastor. <laughs> it is really good to be here this morning, and, and yeah, there, we're going to have a little bit of fun this morning because, well... I mean, he called me and he said, hey, you want to you want to speak on, you know, coming up on a Sunday? And I said, well, yeah, sure, because hey, I love to do that. And and he said, well, kind of we're coming into this part of Genesis. And I was like, OK, that sounds good. And he said the next one. Well, then there's chapter 34. And I looked at that one. And since I'm a glutton for punishment, I chose chapter 34. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you will in about <laughs> in a few minutes. <laughs> this is not the easiest. But you know what? I'm going to give you a spoiler alert right now. Because this scripture, this chapter, ties into so many different things in the book of Genesis, even into Joshua and Judges. It ties into so much. Many times this, this chapter can be skipped because it is a hard chapter. It's a difficult thing to talk about. And people don't want to have to deal with it. But when you look at it and you see how it ties in, it's, it's, it's an integral part. And remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? And it is profitable for reproof, for correction, and instruction, instruction in right, righteousness. So it is. I mean, we know, it's, we know it's a good piece of scripture. Because why? <laughs> it's in the Bible. So it's a good one. And so that's what we're going to talk to about today. So um, first thing, I'm just going to, we'll be picking out verses and reading this. But let's just start with. born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And then Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her, and lay with her, and humiliated her. This is not what this, this passage is about. But I need to stop here. Because this is something that is in our society, You may not even know how much it touches you. This, the uh, statistics are all over the place because so much sexual assault goes unreported. But it would be probably very safe to say that whether you know it or not, everybody in here has been touched by it. Some of you directly. Some of you, when I read that, you hurt. And it's not limited to women. Men are sexually assaulted quite often as well. And it's a hard topic to deal with, but it's real. It's in our society. It's in our church. It's everywhere. I've been touched by it. Some of you know the story of my oldest daughter six years ago. She went to meet a friend. He raped her. That's how it normally goes. It's somebody you trust. What do you know? The scene of somebody grabbing you from a dark alley is not normally very real. Because rape is a violent crime. It's a hate crime. You don't rape somebody because you like them. Because you want to do well by them. You do it to hurt them. And I want you to know it's not your fault. It's not your fault. 
If you look at the scripture in verse 1, it says that, Leah, that uh, Dinah went out to see the women of the land. Some have taken that, and with some validity, um, it could be taken a, really a couple of different ways. One, it just means that she had freedom. She could move about. It was fine. Um, and so she was out and about. Others have looked at other manuscripts from this time period, and it seems that there could be something improper about it. We don't know. But the answer is, it doesn't matter what she did. I ran this stuff by my daughter. And she said, these are her words, it doesn't matter if she stood in front of him and danced naked. He's not allowed to do that. It's not her fault. You've been touched by this, every one of you. By association or by direct action. And it's not your fault. So many people take it and they blame themselves. What if I'd have done this? Or I could have done that. Or maybe I should have been... And I should... It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Don't ever let somebody make you believe it, it is. Because there are people, there are people who will say it's your fault. And they're wrong. And they're lying to you. Like I said, this is a hate crime. This is not something you do to somebody you like. And Shechem took Dinah and lay with her by force. Now we get into something weird. Okay, so a little bit, maybe a little, bit, a little more lighthearted. The next verse says, And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he, and, he, and he loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. What world does this guy live in? This guy, woohoo, you know, he's got some problems. Maybe the whole family does. We'll see that a little bit later because he's the most respected of the family. Um, what's going on? This guy's messed up. He, he, just, he just did something violent to a person and now he loves her? And now he goes to his father and says, I want to marry her. Where is this guy coming from? I don't know. He's messed up in the head. I, 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 I don't know. He went swimming and stayed under too long. I don't know what happened. But, but there's something wrong with this guy. And, you know, so, you know. So he asks his father. He says, hey, get her for my wife. Well... Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Um, then Hamor, the son of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very angry. The men, uh, the Jacob's sons, remember this is Israel, right? He's going to be renamed Israel. You know that, right? And we're talking about Jacob's son, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Yes? You're all on board with this. So this is pivotal stuff, right? So, so these guys, they were out in the field, uh, Jacob hears about this. He knows what's going on. And Hamor makes plans to go and visit Jacob. And they're out in the field. Well, he comes to visit them. And now they come in from the field. And they were happy, right? No. This is their sister. This is their sister. Um, and, and so they come and they have this wonderful little chat. And they come and uh, Hamor and Shechem say, Hey, look, you know, my son, Hamor says, I, I, he wants to marry your daughter. And so, and so you know, we, we live in this land together. There's enough land for us. Um, we, we, we can dwell together. We can trade with each other. And you can acquire property, um, which means stuff. You know, you can, you can get stuff. You can have possessions. And, and we good basis of a family, right? Yes, I want that guy for my son-in-law. Sure, why not? <laughs> 
I don't know about that one. I think uh, I'd shoot him first. <laughs> then he could be my son-in-law. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's kind of, uh, so, okay, right. Like I said, this is a little bit, mm -hmm. this, is, this is a strange story. It's a very strange story. Um, well, not only that, not only that, in all of his wisdom, Shechem says, after, after Hamor says that part, Shechem says, and we'll give you any bride price that you want. Just anything you ask for, name it, it's yours. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, I saw some good camels over there. I, that's pretty good. And, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh-huh. <laughs> he thought he could get, you know, he, he was offering whatever he could. Um, now, mind you, this is a different culture, right? Bride price. Um, my daughter even had a little bit of a reaction to that. It's like bride price, you don't buy women. Actually, it's, kind of, it's basically saying women are valuable. That's what the bride price does. It says women are to be valued. And children are to be valued. If you divorce a woman in that culture and in the culture that we come from in Papua New Guinea, then you would have to pay back the bride price and you would have to pay for the children too. You'd have to pay more than the bride price. These things are valuable. They're not saying, okay, they're worth so many dollars or so much food or so much whatever. They're just saying they're valuable. They're valuable. And so what Shechem is saying is she's really valuable to me. She, I really, really want her. Again, this is kind of a little bit weird. Well, um, the brothers weren't real thrilled about this idea. And they said, um, no, nah, this is not going to work. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his, and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Okay, all of you know what this is, right? Okay, this is real people, okay? A lot of times we look at these things and we think, okay, well, it, 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 that's what they did back then, and that's kind of, you know, we, we don't really relate it into, you know, the here and the now. Uh-huh. And so they're saying, you know what? You need to be circumcised before you give our daughter. We don't want the bride price. We, we, don't want to we don't want to worry about living in the land and all that other sort of stuff. We just want you to be circumcised. Hmm. And what do you think their reaction was? <laughs> That's the funny part. Now their words seem reasonable. <laughs> what? Their words seem reasonable to Hamar and Shechem, Hamor's son. Reasonable? Reasonable? Guys, how many of you are up for this? I'm looking for a hand, looking for a hand, show me a hand. No, I don't see no hands. Um, that's not, okay. Well, let's, let's do it this way. Let's say that you've got, here we go, yeah, I know. Okay, we're doing a Michael Jackson thing, one glove, right? Um, except it's down to one finger. Nevertheless, um, let's say that you guys decide that you need to build a children's center out back. I think there was a plan for that, right? A gymnasium back there at one point or something? Yeah, Greg's saying yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, they're, you know, you're getting bids for this gymnasium slash children's center, and, and you're looking at things, and then, you know what? The prices are so high, and it's just really hard. Not really sure how this is going to go. And then Greg and uh, Alan are in his office, and, uh, you know, for a meeting, and, the, and one of the construction owners comes in and says, you know what, guys? We've looked at this, and we want to help you out. We will build that facility for you, gymnasium with classrooms, for free. For free. All we want you to do, this is all we want you to do, is we want everybody, every adult in the church, to cut off the tip of their pinky. Just the left pinky. Just cut off the tip of your pinky. Greg, Alan, does that sound good to you? <laughs> you willing to give up your pinky for that? <laughs> uh, they're not raising their hand. I don't know why. Maybe because they like that pinky. <laughs> um, well, it sounded reasonable to them. That's funny. <laughs> not only that, these guys were seriously motivational speakers. 
because it says, So Haman and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of the city. Now, this is like a city gate here. You can see a well on the side there. Um, that's kind of what a city gate was. City gate was where everybody went in and out, and so if there was any business to be taken care of, it was done at the city gate. You get water at the city gate. You had business at the city gate. This is, and so they went to the city gate to have a business meeting. And they go to the men of the city and they convince them that this is a good idea. Hamor says, look, hey, you know, these guys, there's plenty of room for all of us. And, and hey, you know, we can trade with them and they can acquire property. And, you know, in the end, really, everything they got is going to be ours because, you know, we're all going to live in one happy family. And so, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you just go ahead and, and you know, we'll, we'll just all do this for their sake. And they agreed. How many of you here are going to agree? Okay, all the men and women, we're just going to include the women too, are going to agree that if they want to build that facility out there, you're going to give up the tip of your left pinky. Yeah, no, um, any, I don't see any hands. <laughs> no hands going up. You like your pinky, don't you? <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> That's how this story goes. All right, it's kind of weird, yes? Because these are real people doing real stuff. And this is real weird. <laughs> and so, well, you may know the story. It says, on the third day, when they were sore, yeah, after three days, that's going to be sore, um, the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their sword and came against the city while it felt secure. Mm, they did answer it deceitfully. That wasn't very nice, was it? We don't know how big this city was. It probably wasn't a huge city. But uh, apparently it was later named after Shechem. So it is the city of Shechem. Um, but they came against them with the sword. And it kind of, we, we get introduced to something here that, that needs a little explanation. You know the Bible has several different types of literature. You know this, you might not have thought about it. It has narrative. We're reading a narrative right now. A narrative just means a story. Acts is a narrative. The Gospels are narratives, right? They tell a story. True? Right? Genesis is primarily a narrative. But within that, you have things like poetry, right? We have poetic books. We got Psalms, yes, right? And we can sing those songs. And that's a different type of literature. You know, they talk about God as our rock and our shield and our fortress. Well, that's he's just being likened to those things, right? We don't say, oh, fake news, he's not a rock. Well, no, he's not a rock. He's not a fortress, but he's strong. He's powerful. These are images of who he, we have letters in the New Testament, right? We have all sorts of different literature. And one of the things that you will find, especially if you ever get to Joshua and Judges, is you will what's, find what's called conquest literature. Conquest literature. And there's a lot of conquest literature in the Bible. Now, let's look at what they said here. It said that the, the, Simeon and Levi came upon all the men and uh, attacked them. And then the brothers came in basically to pick up the spoils. And so it says they killed all the males. It says that they took the livestock inside and outside the city. It says that they took all the wealth, all the children, all the women, and all that was in the houses. You, you notice a theme going on here? Yes? All, 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 all. And you say, <laughs> but Ken, I read ahead, and you're wrong, because they didn't kill everybody. Because if you look in chapter 35, verse 4, guess what's still there? Huh? The city of Shechem. And you go a little bit later in the, in the uh, Genesis narrative, and what do you see? The city of Shechem, because that's where Joseph's brothers have their sheep when Joseph goes to check on them, is outside of Shechem. Hmm. You see it in Joshua and Judges, about 35 different times it's mentioned. All in all, this, the city, or Shechem, is mentioned about 68 times. So Shechem's pretty prevalent. But it said they killed all of them. Is it true? Did they kill all of them? And they're just really fast at reproducing? Ah, uh, probably not. Let's say you open the newspaper, Hood County News. The new Hood County News. Uh, we won't talk about the old one. <clears throat> Hood County News. 
And it's during the football season. <laughs> it's during the football season, and you open it up to the diversions page section that they call it now, and you see the headline, Granberry Slaughters Alito. Yeah! Woo! We got him! And you read it. The final score, 68 to 13. Granberry took him and put him on the ground and had their, and by the end of the first quarter, had their heel firmly on their neck and didn't let up until it was all over. And yet, not a single person died. In fact, EMS was never even called to the field. Do you pick that up and say, fake news! Fake news! You lied! I'm going to sue Hood County News because they lied! Is that what you do? Yes? You think it's a lie? No! It's conquest literature. It is by nature hyperbole. True? You know what hyperbole is? Saying, overstating things. Exaggeration. It is by nature an exaggeration. True? This is conquest literature. Saying, Kent, Bible's not literal. <gasps> what? You, you're not going to sue Hood County News for saying that and say, oh, you're not, you're not being honest in your reporting. The Bible is just using conquest literature. It's telling you, it's giving you the idea. You know what? They beat them bad. They beat them bad. That's what it's saying. They beat them bad. So yeah, Shechem is around. No, not all the males died. No, the whole city wasn't eviscerated. But they beat them bad. That's what you need to know. That's what the point of this is. They beat them bad. Right? We all, we all here now? Some of you are like, nah, I don't know, I like the literal translation better. Ah, let's just go with what they really mean. There's something called, a, here's a fancy word for you, authorial intent. What did the author intend to say? He intended to say, they beat him bad. So they went in and they beat him bad. Um, it says that they uh, killed uh, Shechem um, um, and his father, and they label that one out um, in particular. And uh, so this made Jacob really happy, right? In fact, he knew everybody in the land, the Canaanite and the Perizzites, I think it is, um, that they would all love him. Right now. Because Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. Hmm. Wasn't really happy about that. You notice that if you notice the title at the end, Jacob's sons go too far? Well, I actually, re I actually named this, I, this is my second title. The real title is uh, Jacob's sons raise a stink. <laughs> Because they did, right? They, raised a, they kind of raised a bit of a stink when, she, when they found out what happened to their sister, and then they made themselves stink into the people of the land. Well, Jacob approaches them and tells them, hey, you did wrong. You messed up. You went too far. You shouldn't have done that. And so his sons being the stalwart men that they are, owned it and said, yes, yes, we did, right? You're all looking down at your Bible. What? That's not what mine says. No, nah, in fact, what they do instead is they try to pawn it off and they say, but they said, shouldn't you treat, should we treat our sister? Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? That's owning it, right? No, they didn't own it. They didn't own it. They messed up, and they didn't own it. And because of that, they had to bear the consequences of what they did wrong. Now, this is my opinion, okay? So I always make sure and make sure that's clear. This is my opinion. This is what I see in the Scripture. If you don't agree with me, that's fine. You can be wrong. But let's look at... <laughs> okay, hopefully got at that. Now, nevertheless, if we look at what's going on here... I think what is going on is we have a representative list. Reuben is the firstborn, okay, by Leah. Um, next, Simeon, then Levi. These are the top three guys. Um, in that day, and over in Papua New Guinea, so I, I kind of have a little bit of a clue of uh, some of this sort of stuff, how it works. Um, 
when when the father, the oldest man, usually is the leader of the family. At this point, Jacob is the leader of the family, right? But Jacob is not going to live forever, true? Right? So who's going to be the leader of the family after that? The firstborn, right? Reuben. Uh-huh. But if we look down in chapter, uh, the next chapter in verse 22, it says that Reuben slept with his stepmother. <laughs> um, Bilhah. He was Leah's son, and that was a concubine of Jacob's, and he slept with her. Disqualified. He is now disqualified from leading the family. Simeon and Levi, specifically here, disqualified from leading the family. And as the Bible normal, uh, not normally, but often does, I think this is a representative list. Remember, all the sons of Jacob are included in this. At least the ones that are old enough to be fighting at this time. And we move later on, and what do we find? We find when a new leader is chosen for the family, is it Reuben? No. Is it Simeon? No. Is it Levi? No. It's not even Judah, who's next in line. Who's chosen to lead the family? Joseph. That's what the coat of many colors is. It is a symbol of leadership. Yes, the Bible explicitly states that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children. But he wasn't just giving him a pretty gift. It was so much more than that. You don't wear a colorful coat if you're the foreman on the job. Think about going out to a construction job. You know who the peon is out there because he's dusty and dirty, his, hat, his hard hat is a mess, and he's got a wheelbarrow and he's hauling trash out of the building and hauling supplies into the building, right? You know this guy, he's a mess. You know the workers, there's the ones swinging the hammers. Their helmets are all dirty, uh, dented up, and their clothes are all dirty and filthy. And then you got this guy standing over here with a set of blueprints in front of him, and underneath his safety vest, he's got a suit and a tie on, and his hat's nice and shiny. Who's that? That's the foreman, right? Any of those other workers wearing a suit and tie? No, you don't wear a suit and tie if you're swinging a hammer or hauling trash, true? You wear a suit and a tie if you're the leader, if you're the foreman. Jo J Joseph is the leader of the family. And we see that because he goes out to check on his brothers. He's the leader of the family. He was made the leader of the family. Yes, his father loved him more than all the others, but he was made because he was the one who was qualified to lead the family. We see his character later on. Spoiler alerts here. Right? We see his character later on. And he led the family. So he was chosen as the leader of the family. That's the natural consequences of what Jacob's sons did here. The natural consequence is that they were no longer qualified to lead the family. And they responded well to that. They accepted their punishment. They owned it, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> they killed Joseph. These guys kind of run into theme, don't they? <laughs> They're kind of messed up. That's, how, that's one of the reasons why we know that this is not a religion created by man. If you created this story, would you have included this in, in your narrative of your religion? No. I mean, you've already seen Abraham. He pimps out his wife twice, okay? You, that's not cool, okay? Well, I mean, one time is bad. Twice? Are you kidding me? But he does, <laughs> Okay, you don't include that story if, the, if you're making this up on your own. True? So this is the good, bad, and it's a lot of ugly. There's a lot of ugly. And this is ugly. But they don't, this is the real story. They disqualify themselves from leadership. They have to bear that responsibility, and they are not allowed to be leaders. But there is redemption. There is redemption. If you move down into that Joseph story and you go a little bit further, um, you see J uh, Judah. And Judah, when he 
um, when he goes back, remember the whole Joseph story, okay? So they sell Joseph off, and, uh, and he rises through the ranks, right? And he becomes second most powerful person in all of Egypt. And then his brothers have to go down and buy food from him, yes? And he sees him the first time and says, don't you have another brother? And they say, well, yeah, but he's back with it. You come back with him. And they go back to their father, Jacob, and they say, well, we got to bring Benjamin. And, Benjamin, and his father says, ha, ha, not going to happen. No way. No way. That, no, if, you, if he dies, I'm toast. I'm just, I'm just going to die. I'm just going to give it up. So no, I'm, he's not going. Well, after time goes on, um, there's something that kind of gets them uh, maybe edging towards that, and that's that gnawing in their stomach. <laughs> they get hungry. They got no food. And so Jacob, uh, Ju- yeah, uh, sorry, Judah says to Jacob, get the names right here. Ju- Judah says to Jacob, says, look, send Benjamin with me. Okay, if we don't go back, we're all going to die anyway. So send him with me and I will look after him. I'll take care of him. Judah steps up. Judah steps up. And when he gets to um, the audience with Joseph, he says, Judah is speaking here, for your servant became a pledge of safety, a pledge of safety uh, for the boy to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back to his brothers. He says, don't, don't keep the boy. Don't keep the boy. Keep me. I'll be your servant. I pledge protection, I'll be your servant. And he breaks it. He breaks, really, that curse. And he is, at the end of Israel's life, Jacob, who becomes Israel, blessed first among all the children. He's the one first blessed. And and, uh, Jacob says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff, from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Redemption. Redemption. A lot of us have uh, screwed up in our past, right? We've done some things that are wrong. But there's redemption. Not only Judah, but also Levi. We, move, we fast forward, and it's the descendants of Levi. And you remember the whole golden calf story? Yeah, the, Moses comes down, and they're all dancing and having quite a party in front of this golden calf. Um, quick thing, quick aside there, that's not actually worshiping a false god. They're worshiping God. They're just using an image to do it, which they were expressly forbidden from using. If you look at it, it says that they were worshiping Yahweh, but they were using a golden calf to symbolize his strength. That was a very common thing in the ancient Near East, was to, um, to make an image of a bull or a uh, young male calf to show the strength of their god. And so they just took a page from all the people around them and made a golden calf, and they worshipped Yahweh. But they did it the wrong way. They did it the wrong way. And Moses comes down and he sees this and he says, he stood at the gate of the camp and he said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And who steps up? And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he says, go, punish them. And it says 3,000 fell by the sword that day. And when they come back and it's done, Moses says, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. They broke the curse. They owned it. They said, we're on the Lord's side. We'll do what God says. And they redeemed themselves. And they are now the tribe of the priest. We have redemption too, don't we? Our redemption is even greater, isn't it? It says in Titus, 
waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. We are redeemed through Christ. We have been bought back. True? We have redemption. We've all made mistakes in the past. I know I have. Maybe I maybe it's just me, right? I mean, you know, you can you kind of really blown it, but you know, we're we're good people. And that's why I like this church so much. There's such good people here, right? No, we've all messed up. <laughs> Actually, I do like this church, and there are good people here, but you've messed up. Everybody's messed up. But there's redemption. There's redemption through Jesus Christ. He came and he redeemed us. There is redemption. And now to run full circle back to the beginning. A lot of times assault victims feel a sense of shame. Shame because, oh, I could have done this differently, or I should have done that differently. Or somehow, oh, it was my fault. They feel shame. Men even more so feel shame because they feel powerless when they feel like they should have been powerful. But you know what? Christ died, and he bore our shame. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Despite the pictures that you normally see, the Romans crucified men at ground level so that people could walk up and spit in their face and pull out their beard. And they were crucified naked. Totally naked. I know the promise doesn't show that because, well, it's rated R, not rated X. (laughs) But they did it along streets where you would see them passing by, and they were at ground level, and they were naked. In torture, nakedness is often employed because it takes away from that person a sense of hope. They're totally exposed. They have no hope. Christ hung on that cross naked at ground level, at eye level, with the people walking by him. And he suffered and he died. And he bore our shame. If you feel shame, it's not because you're listening to God. It's because you're listening to other voices in your head. And those are not from God. You're listening to voices that say, you. You should have done this. You could have done that. Accusatory voices from the accuser. God says, I bore your shame. I died in shame. If anybody knows shame, it is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who redeemed you for himself. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your redemption. I thank you that you have redeemed us for yourself. Father, I thank you that you have borne our shame. We have no reason to feel shame for anything that we have done or anything that was done to us. And we are redeemed by your blood, bought back, 
And now we are a precious people that belongs to you. Father, thank you for your redemption. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. The gospel is awesome. He redeems. He redeems. He redeems. You know, we all know of Jesus as a member of the tribe of Judah, right? Fulfilling the messianic promise given to Judah. But it's often overlooked that Mary's cousins were Levites of the tribe of Levi, another tribe that had been redeemed. John the Baptist was the son of a priest, tribe of Levi. Elizabeth was a descendant of Aaron. Yeah. So he redeems every situation. Maybe you think, well, I don't come from a blue blood line. We all come from Adam. Amen. And we're all redeemed by the ultimate blue blood, the red blood of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship the Lord before we leave. Thank you, Father, for your, for your mercies, for redeeming us, for restoring us, for resurrecting us. Thank you, Jesus. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And may you walk in the light of his redemption over every situation that comes and goes and has been in the past as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go get him, Tigers. God bless you. <laughs>